it's a beautiful windy day today the skies are relatively clear it's blue and it's quite warm outside it's currently 33 degrees celsius which is about 91 fahrenheit i've got a canopy behind me we've set it up over the weekend for Miki's birthday that way some of the guests could sit out here and marvel at the view in this episode we're going to talk about sun exposure and how it affects the plants and in this case i would have to remove the canopy because it's providing a lot of shade to those plants right here i'll have this gun after the intro All clear now. With the canopy gun, this guys right here would be getting full sun now. And that begs a question. What exactly is full sun? Full sun. Let's talk about full sun. You know, one of my pet peeves, something that really grinds my gears, is whenever I see someone who claims that their plant is getting full sun, and when they show you photos, the plants are stretching out. I don't believe you. The thing is, I found out that the definition of full sun varies from person to person. It should be simple enough, right? From the name itself, it should mean that something is getting something is exposed to sun from morning, afternoon till night, from the time the sun rises to the time the sun sets. It sounds simple, right? The problem I think lies in the fact that people are mistaking full sun with full exposure. I don't mean to muddy it even further by adding another term, but when I say full exposure, it is full exposed to the elements, which means there's no protective covering over it. And this is the case with all of my landscapes. They are fully exposed. There's no roof on top of them to protect them from anything. And although I can say that they are fully exposed, they do not necessarily get full sunlight. Now, how is that possible? I think it would be a lot easier if I just show you around. We're going to return the focus back to this garden. I'm going to prefix all of this by saying that that is due north, and that would be east, and this side is west. That should give you an idea of where the sun rises and where the sun sets. And now let's have a look at some plants. These plants are along the west fence, so what do you think? The correct answer is, it's not getting full sun. So as you could imagine, when the sun is low in the afternoon, then the fence would be blocking this area, would be casting a shadow over these plants. And a few hours from now, this would be enjoying the shade. A telltale sign that they're not getting full sunlight is if you look at all of the flower stalks and the way they are oriented, you could see that they are all pointing that way. It's so evident if you look at all of the flower stalks, the way they grow. So you could see that there's a slight tilt to that direction. So it means that they're trying to reorient themselves towards that general spot because they believe that if they face that way, they would be getting the optimal amount of sunlight. You will definitely see it with all of the plants here. If you leave them like that and allow them to keep growing like they are right now, then you would notice that they would all be deforming. So they would be growing sideways or at least one side the leaves would be straight and the others would be folding this way. This domingo is an example of that. elevate one side and do it like this so if i were to redo this landscape i would be raising this spot and lowering that spot so it would be an incline and they would be all facing that way now let's have a look at another spot now how about this spot this spot is built right next to the house and our house is forming the eastern wall so as you could imagine, when the sun is low in the morning and it's about to rise, this would be shaded, this would be covered. So as you could imagine, while the sun is low during sunrise, this whole area is shaded and only starts getting light, direct sunlight, when the sun is high enough that it is no longer blocked by the house. So like the previous spot, this spot is not getting full sun. Telltale signs, again, like in the previous spot, you could have a look at the flowers, the direction they're pointing, at the same time, you could have a look at all of the rosettes. You could clearly see that a lot of these echeverias are pointing at a certain direction. They are turning, twisting themselves. They are reorienting their whole body to get the optimum amount of sunlight. I've corrected my agaboides bunch at the back to 
compensate for that and I tilted all of their pots but unfortunately the rest of these plants are still laying flat so they are twisting themselves this one is showing the worst of it all same thing with the Mexican giant it is facing this way it's not perfectly balanced Thanos would be mad let's take a look at this pot next so the plants on this pot seem to be oriented properly or at least they're facing directly upwards and looking at all of the flowers on these sedums, it looks like they are all upright which tells me that they are getting enough sun they do not need to reorient themselves to find a lot more exposure so this spot right here is getting enough sun exposure let's have a look at these spots next so the setup here is pretty much the same the first thing you would notice is that the plants further out from the fence the ones that you see right here they seem to be oriented properly the, the flower stalks are upright the rosettes are not twisting are not deformed so they are getting good enough exposure right here but as for the plants closer to the fence they seem to be tilting a bit deformed searching for sunlight so it might not be a good spot for the younger for the actively growing plants a lot of the plants that I have here especially on the pedestals are a bit more mature compared to the other plants so they could get away with less sunlight well at least I noticed that some of the mature plants do not require as much but then again it depends on the hybrid or the species now these plants that you see right here these are the plants that I have for sale and as such I'm keeping them out here further out from the fence that way they would keep they would not deform they would be getting more sunlight compared to the rest here and I would like them to look their best especially since they are going to the shop so I'm giving them more sunlight as you can clearly see not all of them are mature so I would need to shade them somehow in the heat of summer so I'll be setting up a shade structure above them or I'll be moving them somewhere else where they could receive more shade Now this spot right here, this is at the back, it's quite far from the west fence and a bit closer to the eastern fence but not close enough. So this spot gets a lot more sunlight compared to the spot where I place all the plants that I sell. And these imbricatas right here are the most hardened of all of the imbricatas that I have. So if I had to pick from the strongest of my specimens then this ones would be it. You know what? Something I could totally do is to place some plants on the roof on top of me. This is the roof covering our alfresco. It has a very slight pitch, a slight angle. It's not as steep as our regular roof and there's less chance, or at least there's a little chance of uh, pots falling over or being blown away. But I won't be doing that because it's a pain going up there unless I have a proper ladder. Because I only have this step ladder which I could use inside the house, maybe some outside. But it's not tall enough that I have to stand on it precariously just to get to the roof. And it's a scary experience, man. Anyway, I've shown you several spots in my garden where I have my plants located. And you can clearly see that there's a different amount of sunlight depending on the position and the orientation relative to the sun. I think it's worth mentioning that I'm in the southern hemisphere and at an extreme latitude at that. And knowing that latitude is pretty much important because that defines the angle at which you would be getting an optimal amount of sun exposure. You would probably know this if you had solar panels on your rooftop. So depending on your latitude, your location, there's an optimal angle at which your solar panels must be positioned that way they would be getting the most amount of sunlight on average throughout the year now how is that relevant now to make things easier to visualize imagine that this ball is the earth and this line right here is the equator and yes the earth is not flat so if you're a flat earther better turn away now <laughs> I'm sure you've learned this in school that the earth axis is tilted by it's, I think it was 23 degrees so something like this and if you imagine that the Sun is right here it would be shining this way there's a different distribution of sunlight throughout the year when the Sun is here and the earth is here the northern hemisphere is getting more sunlight but when it goes to the other side then the southern hemisphere is getting more sunlight and that explains the reverse seasons between the northern and the southern hemispheres again when the earth is here and the Sun is here 
the northern hemisphere is getting a lot more sunlight which means that it's summer in the northern hemisphere the southern hemisphere is getting less sunlight which means that they're experiencing winter at the moment the reverse is true if the sun is here and the earth is here the southern hemisphere is getting more sunlight which means that it's summer here and winter on the opposite side and that's what's happening right now so why was all of that relevant the intensity of sunlight differs throughout the day so during sunset and sunrise the sun is low sun is near the horizon so there's fewer direct rays reaching a certain point but when the sun is high up there's more direct sunlight collecting on an area and the sunlight is more intense the intensity of sunlight does not stay the same from one day to the next there are many factors affecting the intensity of sunlight and one of which would be cloud cover so if there's more clouds then of course there's more blocking the sunlight and you would not get enough sunlight throughout the day we've got some solar panels installed on our rooftop it is rated at 5.4 kilowatts and at peak conditions like today we would get around 5 kilowatts around midday and like i said the intensity varies throughout the day during sunrise there's little sun and during midday there's lots more sun and sunset again it goes down so it forms some sort of a bell curve and in case of our system it goes as high as 5 kilowatts it produces 5 kilowatts of power during midday the peak but that peak does not stay the same every single day because when we have cover when we have clouds when it's cloudy when it rains a little bit of cloud cover drastically reduces the solar output here's a few graphs from different days showing you how much they differ So that's the daily part. Another thing that you have to take note of is that the sunlight, the sun intensity differs across seasons as well. So I've already mentioned this earlier that in summer you get more sunlight and in winter you get less. For those living in the tropics, it's going to be almost constant throughout the year except for a very tiny strip where, where the sun is always perpendicular to the earth. And there would be a point in which the sun is so directly above overhead that the shadow cast it's just directly down it looks like you're floating you know there's no shadow there's no shadow to see but in any case most likely you would see a variation in shadow length throughout the year during summer especially around the summer solstice the length of day would be the longest and during winter the reverse in the winter solstice the length of day would be the short so that means that in summer there's more time for the plants to be exposed to sun well, in winter, it's the reverse, there's less time. But how is that piece of knowledge relevant to this discussion at hand? Well, I've since learned, especially since I do landscapes, what I do is I do all of my landscaping, my planning during winter, or at least towards the end of winter. Because that means that I am planting, I am checking the reaction of my plants during the season with the least amount of sunlight. That way I could find out if they are doing fine in that spot. I work on my landscapes during the end of winter, and the latest would be early spring and that's for a couple reasons the first reason is that it's still cold enough that i could leave my plants outside and they could be acclimatized to the sunlight and winter is when there's the least amount of sunlight and you would want them to start with the least amount and gradually increase their exposure through throughout the weeks and months so rather than doing it manually where you find a spot in your garden where there's the least amount of sunlight then constantly transferring them every few weeks or so you could just place them in a single spot in winter and let the seasons do the work for you Another thing why I like my plants to be out, to be full exposed in winter is because that if they do not etiolate, if they do not get leggy in the spot that they are, then I'm pretty sure that for the rest of the year, the rest of the seasons, they would not get leggy as well. Because they are already experiencing the least amount of sunlight that they would get and from there it would just be more sunlight. There's a technical and accurate way to figure out the amount of sunlight and that's by using a light meter or a lux meter but unfortunately I don't have one and I am not planning to get one mainly because I can't be bothered to spend on one I might have to get one for myself at some point because as you know I like doing my research and I would like to back everything that I say with actual hard data but for now I have an alternative method which I'm going to teach you and that's by using indicator plants so what are indicator plants Indicator plants are plants that you can easily grow. Uh, they can grow quite quickly or you could have you could propagate a lot of them at a very short time. And what you do with them is you could subject them to various locations, positions just to see how they're doing. 
In my case, I used indicator plants to check out and see if a spot is getting enough sunlight. So I use my indicator plants to indicate the light levels. There are many other indicator plants that are being used to measure other things like moisture, pH level, whatever else that could use them for. And this is based on how the plants react to those conditions. So for example, if you're going to check for moisture, you could place a specific plant that you know you're going to be planting a lot of. Place them in various spots. If you see that they're go doing really well in one spot, then this spot is a good spot. And if you see that they seem to be rotting or not doing well in another spot, then you have to do something about it or avoid planting there. In my case, I think I've got my soil composition down already. So I've got the soil composition I need, which works for me in my climate. So all I have to worry about is the sun exposure. And there's this specific plant which I use as my indicator plant. And if you've been following Let's Plant for quite a while now, then you might have an idea what that plant is. I'll give you a chance to guess. Okay. So the indicator plant that I use is the Echeveria imbricata. Since I mostly collect Echeveria, it makes sense that I use the imbricata. And what I do is I would plant them everywhere, everywhere around the garden and see how they react. If they improve within weeks or months, then I know that that spot is working well for them. It also gives me an idea of how much sun exposure each spot gets. If it looks like the imbricata is in a spot where it is going all green or it's starting to stretch out, then I know that there's not enough sunlight. This also tells me that plants that would require less sunlight would work very well in this spot. So the thing is, if you pick your indicator plant, a plant that you can grow enough of or you have a lot of, and a plant that you're so familiar with that you know how it grows, you know how much care you usually need to give it or how much sun, then all you have to do is to compare with it whenever you have a new plant you just have to compare the living conditions the growing conditions of one plant compared to the imbricata that way by seeing how the imbricata grows you would know how this other plant would go if you place it in the same spot as the imbricata and that's how you use indicator plants effectively and going back to my preference of planting in winter or towards the end of winter is that by doing it when the light levels the sun levels are pretty low it means that i'm going to use that as a baseline and the sun levels would only be greater than that throughout the year which means that i can rest easy knowing that it will not be getting darker than that i'm pretty sure you know this that it's a lot easier and cheaper to add shade on top of your plants rather than trying to reinforce the amount of sunlight the amount of light that they get grow lights can be so expensive man this is also why it's important that you monitor your plants throughout the year take photos if you need to take videos see how they are doing throughout the year don't just check a single month or a single season and that's why i prefer having indicator plants because if i lose them if they rot or die or burn then it's not really a big loss to me they serve mainly to give me points of data a reference of light levels so this is something this is a little trick that i do to help me determine which plants should go in what spot. So I hope you find this tip about using indicator plants useful and now that it's summer I might need to shade my plants. So I probably have to do that in the next episode because it's going to take a lot of effort for me. So I'll see you in the next episode where we're going to discuss the importance of using shade in summer and all the things that comes with it. So I'll see you in that episode. Bye! Special thanks to my Patreon supporters that's Oscarino, Julie Seal, Snap Kui, Lorena Noti, Camila Baez, Linda Leal, Gwen Ott, Jesse May, Q2, and everyone else who pledge on Patreon. Thank you so much. And finally, you can check out my Instagram that's at Siriska Page and I post a photo of an Echeveria every single day under the hashtag Daily Echeveria.